hello happy 422 that's the time <laughs> genevieve awesome to see you here so it is called tuesday and uh man i've been through so many books this morning and last night trying to think what am i gonna read what, what are we gonna read today and um i mean last minute i decided okay we're gonna do this one i already had like two other ones set up but today we are going into journeys out of the body by robert a monroe author of far journeys the classic work on out of body experience so let's check it out uh yeah Thanks for stopping by, y'all alls. Whenever you happen upon this, I hope it's the perfect time for you. Let's see what it says. Robert, oh, son of a gun, right? I was jamming out to Queen Herbie and I forgot to set my microphone up. Eee. <laughs> okay. <sighs> then we can have, you know, more consistent sound. All right, now let's find out. Robert A. Monroe has been a pioneer in exploring out-of-body experiences and out-of-journeys, oh, and journeys, out-of-the-body. His first book has become the undisputed classic in the field. <laughs> I don't know. That wasn't super, that was a great first start. <laughs> hey, cool gamer, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> he had a long and distinguished career in the broadcasting industry as a writer, director of programs, and creator and producer of some 400 radio and TV network programs, and eventually as owner and operator of a radio network and cable TV system in Virginia. I love Virginia. It's, it's the state for lovers. <laughs> I do. I love it. <laughs> He is the founder and executive director of the Monroe Institute, internationally known for its work on the effects of sound wave forms on human behavior. Ooh, cool. Robert Monroe's second book, Far Journeys, tells the story of his research and development of the OOB out-of-body experience and further explorations beyond time and space. It was published by Double Day in 1985. Mr. Monroe plays an active part in the work of the Monroe Institute and lives with his family in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. Oh man, I, I love the Blue Ridge Mountains. I love them. Journeys out of the body. A foreword. Yay! Hey, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Yay. Look at, look at. Okay, cool. Forward. Much has taken place both in the world and in my personal life since the final manuscript days prior to the publication of Journeys Out of the Body. It was an interesting experience, to say the least, when I publicly became a member of a highly suspect group, suspect group, labeled psychic, sensitive, freak, and more generously, parapsychologist. The publication of the book quite thoroughly blew my cover as a reasonably orthodox business executive. However, a good many of the results were totally unexpected, and some of the serious trepidations were unfounded. For example, the fact that I was, and still am, well-grounded and active in the material world of business helped greatly in the serious consideration of the book material. Another faucet. I should have had more faith and confidence in the business mind as I know it. I had always maintained that business and industry respected something of value without particular regard to its origin. If it works, use it. Still, I was greatly concerned about the reaction to the book of the board of directors of the corporation of which I was president, who I would want such an, oh, who would want such an unstable person running their multi -billion, multi million dollar operation. At the first board meeting, board meeting in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 
after the book publication. No one mentioned it, nor did I. However, as we cruised up the canal in the board chairman's yacht, on our way to dinner at the country club, the chairman's wife came up from below deck with a copy of Journeys in her hand. Bob, will you autograph this for me? She asked. I complied, more than a little self-conscious and surprised. I should not have been. Interesting stuff, the chairman called over his shoulder as I steered for the, for the yacht club dock. My wife is a real psychic. I never make a major business deal without a reading from her. It works, too. <laughs> you never know where people's hearts are, you know? Yeah, dang. Um, needless to say, <laughs> that's how it starts next. <laughs> Needless to say, I was not asked to resign. Actually, I found little or no adverse effect on my business relationships as a result of the public disclosure of this private side of my life. Instead, many broad new avenues opened up to me, totally unexpected. Who could have guessed that I would sneak out? Uh, who, who would have guessed that I would speak out? Oh my goodness. Speak on out-of-body experiences at, at such an august and conservative body as the Smithsonian Institution. It actually happened. Another miscalculation, or so it would seem. It has been stated that Journeys was a book ahead of its time, that serious interest in the type of material it contains is only now reaching significant levels. This may have been true, yet was it that pre... This may have been true, yet what it was precipitated... What it was, mother of pearls, I'm really struggling here. Let's try that again. This may have been true, yet what was it that precipitated such changes in a mere four years? I like to think a chicken or the egg question is appropriate. That this book was and is part of a trigger or cataclytic, pro uh, catalytic process that is now in chain reaction. Dude, that's like the third day in the row that, uh, that, the chicken or egg thing has been uh, referenced. That's cool. <laughs> this process states simply, it's okay to have strange experiences, to consider seriously as natural those events and activities beyond the present ability of our physical sciences to replicate or measure. Existence beyond death is one of these. Another decision made about the time of publication, that my conscious mind or self had insufficient experience and or training to control in toto the scope of such non-physical exploration. <laughs> toto. <laughs> I never, it's the first time I've ever done that. I used it in a sentence. <laughs> and it makes me feel silly, but it, all right. This was brought about first by the boredom and impatience of here to there and back tests in our physical world. Who wants repeatedly to take an hour dressing in preparation? Wire up to instruments, develop a careful separation, a separative state just to go from bedroom to kitchen, Virginia to California or Kansas. Second, many explanations were taking place far beyond my conscious understandings and con understanding and control, which inferred that the physical conscious I actually had very limited ideas as to where to go and what to do. Thus, I made an important decision. For the most part, I would set up the conscious out-of-body state, then turn the action over to my total self, soul, question mark, my present consciousness would go alone for the ride as a part of the whole. The results have been ecstatic, illuminating, confusing, awe-inspiring, humbling, reassuring, experience and exploration far beyond my ability to conceive of, most of it an apparent educational program that I am absorbing bit by bit. The program as I sense it, the program as I sense it is simple. 
Eventually, a quantum jump in consciousness will be required to reduce the material to a practical something of value level. <laughs> I like this, guys. I like it. <clears throat> what does this mean? What uh, does the great consciousness cha change take place while still alive physically? Or in another reality later? Who are the instructors, the helpers? Precisely bit by bit, we are beginning to approach the answers in our research at the Institute. Yes, a research faci facility was formed and became active in 1972. Our work has att attracted the interest and cooperation of physicists, psychologists, biochemists, engineers, educators, psychiatrists, corporate presidents, statisticians, many of whom serve on our board of advisors. Among the 11,000 plus pieces of mail received to date, many sighs of relief were reported. The secret could be talked about without the need for s sanity hearings. Thus, the book is serving its primary purpose. Over 700 persons have participated in our research and experimental training program. Our first explorer team has six members. Some 50 more are waiting for our facility to handle their final indoctrination, and their number is growing daily. We hope to be able to expand shortly in physical space, equipment, and personnel so that we can absorb the backlog and the increase. This year, training programs at the Institute may qualify for credit at the college and university level. Meanwhile, our explorer team of six is bringing back data faster than we can process it, far more rapidly and diverse than I alone could accumulate. That which we have sorted is overwhelming in its import. The fact of consensus and agreement from six different explorers, each unaware of the other's experiences except in joint operations, has had a formidable impact upon those who have examined the material. The details will be reported in another book, which is which is in preparation. Ooh, so juicy. Feels like I already want to get and I haven't even read this one. <laughs> Blue, awesome. Welcome. Welcome. Yay. <laughs> so awesome. A lot of action to pack into four years. It only strengthens the concept of accelerated change at work, especially the change in human needs. I have reviewed journeys again carefully for this new edition. I'm happy to say that nothing has been altered in the light of later experience. The basics are still the same. From the point of my experimental level at the time, it is still accurate. One item we do know. The reality of your reading these words with your left brain hemisphere is the first stage of filtration. Robert A. Monroe, Afton, Virginia, seven, uh, 1977. I, I would love to have property in Virginia. I love it there so much. I was looking at campgrounds just this past couple of weeks. I, When I was hiking along the Appalachian Trail, I, I went to Virginia to do it because I, I had two weeks. And um, man... I leave it there. All right, that was the forward, and now we're going to read the introduction. In our action oriented society, sorry, there's, I didn't realize there's this, this, this thing down here. I'll, I wonder if it's still the address. I'm going to read it. For those interested in the activities of the Institute or who have had spontaneous out-of-body experiences, write Monroe Institute of Applied Sciences, P.O. Box 57, Afton, Virginia, 22920. Hmm. So intro. In our action-oriented society, when a man lies down to sleep, he is effectively out of the picture. He will lie still for six to eight hours, so he is not behaving or thinking productively or doing anything significant. We all know that people dream, but we raise our children to regard dreams and other experiences occurring during sleep as unimportant, as not real in the way that the events of the day are. 
Thus, most people are in the habit of forgetting their dreams, and on the occasions when they do remember them, they usually regard them as mere oddities. It is true that psychologists and psychiatrists regard the dreams of patients as useful clues to the malfunctioning of their personalities, but even in this application, dreams and other nocturnal experiences are generally not treated as real in any sense, but only as some sort of internal data processing of the human computer. There are some important exceptions to this general put-down of dreams, but for the vast majority of people in our society today, dreams are not things that serious people consider themselves with. <laughs> what are we to make of a person who takes exception to this general belief, who claims to have, to have had experiences during sleep or other forms of unconsciousness that were not only impressive to him, but which he feels were real. Suppose this person claims that on the previous night he had an experience of flying through the air over a large city, which he soon recognized as New York. Further, he tells us that not only was this dream intensively, intensive, intensely vivid, but that not only was this dream... Oh, but that he knew at the time that it was not a dream, that he was really in the air over New York City. And this conviction that was really there sticks with him for the rest of his life, despite our reminding him that a sleeping man couldn't really be flying by himself in the air over New York City. That's why I always believed I could fly, because I always flew at night. And like, I... I just thought I just I walked around the world for a long time just believing that everyone could fly, even though it's so silly that I'm just like. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> Someone had to challenge me and I like jumped off stuff and like I was like, oh, my gosh, you mean I can't fly? <laughs> Thank God it wasn't a roof. It was on a playground. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> yes yes i am blushing in fact okay <clears throat> probably we will ignore a person who makes such a report or we will politely or not so politely inform him that he is becoming a little weak in the head or crazy and suggests that he see a psychotherapist if he is insistent about the reality of his experience, especially if he has other strange experiences too, we may, with the best of intentions, see about committing him to a mental hospital. Our traveler, on the other hand, if he is smart, will quickly learn not to talk about his experiences. The only problem with that, as I have found from talking to many such people, is that he may worry about whether he's going crazy. For the sake of argument, let's make our traveler even more troubled, troubling. Suppose in his account, he goes on to say that after flying over New York City for a while, he flew down to your apartment. There he saw you and two other people, unknown to him, conversing. He describes the two people in detail and mentions a few things about the topic of conversation occurring in the minute or so he was there. Let's suppose he is correct. At the time he had his experience, you were holding a conversation on the topic he mentions with two people who fit our traveler's descriptions. What do we make of things now? Dude, I just got that crazy equilibrium thing that happened. Weird. It was like, ooh. <laughs> okay. The usual reaction to a hypothetical situation of this type is that it is all very interesting, but as we know that it couldn't possibly happen, we needn't seriously think about what it might mean. Or we might comfort ourselves by invoking the word coincidence, a marvelous word coincidence, for reliving mental upsets, or oh, relieving mental upsets. Unfortunately for our peace of mind, there are thousands of instances reported by normal people of exactly this sort of occurrence. We are not dealing with a purely hypothetical situation. Such events have been termed traveling clairvoyance, astral projection, or a more scientific term, 
out-of-body experiences, or OOBEs. I just thought they were OBEs, but... We can formally define an OOBE as an event in which the experiencer, one, seems to perceive some portion of some environment which could not possibly be perceived from where his physical body is known to be at the time, and two, knows at the time that he is not dreaming or fantasizing. The experiencer seems to possess his normal consciousness at the time, and even though he may reason that this cannot be happening, he will feel all his normal critical faculties to be present, and so knows he is not dreaming. Further, he will not decide after awakening that this was a dream. However, or how, then, do we understand this strange phenomenon? If we look at to scientific sources for information about OOBEs, we shall find practically none at all. Scientists have, by and large, simply not paid any attention to these phenomena. The situation is rather similar to that of the scientific literature on extrasensory perception, or ESP. Phenomena such as telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, and psychokinesis are impossible in terms of the current physical view worldview. Since they can't happen, most scientists do not bother to read the evidence indicating that they do happen. <laughs> and not having read the evidence, their belief in the impossibility of such phenomena is reinforced. This kind of circular reasoning in support of one's comfortable belief system is not unique to scientists in any means, but it has resulted in very little scientific research on ESB or OOBEs. In spite of the lack of hard scientific data, there are still a number of definite conclusions one can make from reading what material there is. First, out-of-body experiences are a universal human experience, not in the sense that they happen to large numbers of people, but in that they have happened all through recorded history, and there are marked similarities in the experience among people who are otherwise extremely different in terms of cultural background. One can find reports of out-of-body experiences by housewives in Kansas, which closely resemble accounts of out-of-body experiences from ancient Egyptian or Oriental sources. Second, the out-of-body experience is generally a once-in-a-lifetime experience, seemingly experienced by accident. Illnesses sometimes bring it about, especially illnesses which are almost fatal. Great emotional stress sometimes brings it about, in many cases, it simply happens during sleep without our having any idea of what might have caused it. In very rare instances, instances it seems to have been brought about by a deliberate attempt. <clears throat> Third, the experience of an out-of-body experience is usually one of the most profound experiences of a person's life and radically alters his beliefs. Ha. Just. This is usually expressed as, I no longer believe in survival of death or an immortal soul. I know that I will survive death. The person feels that he is directly experienced being alive, or he has directly experienced being alive and conscious without his physical body, and therefore knows that, the, that he possesses some kind of soul that will survive bodily death. This does not logically follow, for even if the out-of-body experience is more than just an interesting dream or hallucination, it was still occurring while the physical body was alive and functioning and therefore may depend on the physical body. This argument, however, makes no impression on those who have actually had an out-of-body experience. Thus, regardless of what position one wants to take on the reality of the out-of-body experience, it is clearly an experience deserving considerable psychological study. I am certain that our ideas concerning the existence of souls have resulted from early experiences of people having out-of-body experiences. Considering the importance of the idea of the soul to most of our religions, and the importance of religion in people's lives, it seems incredible that science could have swept this problem under the rug so easily. Yeah, it's like brainwashing. <laughs> Fourth. Or, I mean, it's just our frame of... Yeah, yeah, all right. 
Fourth, the OOBE is generally extremely joyful to those who have it. I would make a rough estimate that between 90 and 95 percent of the people who have had this experience are very glad it occurred and find it joyful, while 5 percent are very frightened by it, for the only way they can interpret it while it is happening is that they are dying. Later, reactions of the person as he attempts to interpret his out-of-body experience can be rather negative, however. Almost every time I give a speech on this subject, someone comes up to me afterward and thanks me for talking about it. They had had the experience some time before, but had no way of explaining it and worried that they were going crazy. Fifth, in some instances of out-of-body experiences, the description of what was happening at a distant place is correct and more accurate than we would expect by coincidence. Not the majority, by any means, but some. To explain these, we must postulate either that the hallucinatory experience of the OOBE was combined with the operation of ESP, or that in some sense the person really was there. The out-of-body experience then becomes very real indeed. The fact that most of our knowledge about out-of-body experiences comes from reports of once-in-a-lifetime experiences puts us at two serious disadvantages. The first of these is that most people cannot produce an out-of-body experience at will, so this precludes the possibility of studying them under precise laboratory conditions. The second disadvantage is that when a person is suddenly thrust for a brief period of time into a very novel environment, he may not be a very good observer. He is too excited and too busy trying to cope with the strangeness of it. Thus, our reports from the once-in-a-lifetime people are very rough. But thus, our reports from the once-in-a-lifetime people are very rough. It would be of great advantage in studying out-of-body experiences to have trained travelers available who could produce the experience at will and who generally had the characteristics of a good reporter. <laughs> the book you are about to read is very rare. It is a first-hand account of hundreds of out-of-body experiences by a person who is, I believe, a good reporter. Nothing like it has been published in many years. Robert A. Monroe is a successful businessman who began experiencing out-of-body experiences quite unexpectedly over a decade ago. Coming from an academic family and having more than the average intellectual training, he realized the unusualness of these experiences and began taking systematic notes from the beginning. I shall not say more about his experiences per se. His accounts in the rest of the book are too fascinating and lucid to warrant further introduction here. Instead, I shall note the qualities he's, he possesses that make him a good reporter and which give me a good deal of confidence in his accounts. When most people have a profound experience, especially one with religious import, Careful questioning will usually reveal that their original account of it was not so much an account of what happened as of what they thought it meant. As an example, let us suppose th that what really happens to a person is that he finds himself floating in the air above his body in the middle of the night. While still surprised at this, he perceives a shadowy, dim figure at the end of the room and then a blue circle of light floats past the figure from left to right. Then our experiencer loses consciousness and wakes up to find himself in his body. A good reporter will describe essentially that scene. Many people will say in perfectly good faith, something like, my immortal soul was raised from the tomb of my body by the grace of God last night. And an angel appeared as a symbol of God's favor. The angel showed me a symbol of wholeness. <laughs> I have often seen distortions this, this great when I've been able to question an individual about exactly what happened, but most of the published accounts of out-of-body experiences have not been subjected to this kind of questioning. The statements that God's, the statements that God's will caused the out-of-body experience, that the dim figure turned into an angel, that the blue circle was a symbol of wholeness are all things that are part of a person's interpretation, not his experience. 
Most people are not aware of the extent to which their mind automatically interprets things. They think they are perceiving things as they are. Robert Monroe is unique among the small number of people who have written about repeated out-of-body experiences in that he recognizes the extent to which his mind tries to interpret his experiences, to force them into familiar patterns. Thus, his accounts are particularly v valuable, for he works very hard to try to tell it like it is. The initial series of laboratory studies we were able to do occurred over a period of several months between September 1965 and August 1966. While I was able to use the faculties of the Electroencephalographic Brainwave Laboratory of the University of Virginia Medical School. I think I said that right. <laughs> Okay. Heart rate, the electrocardiogram. Hey, wait. No, no, okay. I'm, I'm, okay. Now I'm to this paragraph. On eight occasions, Mr. Monroe was asked to try to produce an out of body experience while hooked up to various instruments for measuring psychological, oh, physiological functions. He was also asked to try to direct his movements during the out of body experience into the adjoining rooms, both to observe the activity of the technician monitoring the record, monitoring the recording equipment, and tr to try to read a five-digit random target number, which was placed on a shelf six feet above the door, the floor. Measurements were made of Mr. Monroe's brainwaves, the electroencephalogram, eye movements, and heart rate, the electrocardiogram. The laboratory was, unfortunately, not very comfortable for... Unfortunately, not very comfortable for lying still for prolonged periods. We had to bring an army cot into the recording room as there was no bed. One of the connections for recording brain waves, the ear electrode, was a clip tape, or a clip type that caused some irritation to the ear, and this made relaxation somewhat difficult. On the first seven nights during which he attempted to produce an out-of-body experience, Mr. Monroe was not successful. On his eighth night, he was able to produce two very brief out-of-body experiences, and these are described in some detail in his own words on page 69 through 72. The first out-of-body experience involved witnessing some unrecognized people talking at an unknown location, so there was no way of checking whether it was fantasy or a real perception of events happening at a distance. In the second brief out-of-body experience, Mr. Monroe reported he couldn't control his movements very well, so he did not report on the target number in the adjacent room. He did correctly describe that the laboratory technician was out of the room and that a man later identified as her husband was with her in a corridor. As a parapsychologist, I cannot say that this proves that Mr. Monroe really knew what was happening at a distance. It is hard to assess the improbability of such an event occurring after the fact. Nevertheless, I found this result quite encouraging for one of the initial attempts to bring such an unusual phenomenon into the laboratory. <laughs> this is juicy. My next opportunity to work with Mr. Monroe in the laboratory came when he visited me in California during the summer of 1968. We were able to have a single laboratory session under such under much more comfortable circumstances. A normal bed was available rather than a cot, and we used a different type of electrode for measuring brain waves, which was not physically comfortable. Dude. Um, <clears throat> I got, I'm going to turn that off. Um, physically comfortable under these conditions, Mr. Monroe was able to produce two brief out of body experiences. He woke, he awoke almost immediately after the first OOBE had ended and estimated that it had lasted eight to 10 seconds. The brain wave record just before he awoke again, showed a stage one pattern with possibly a single rapid eye movement occurring during that time. His blood pressure showed a sudden drop, a steady low lasting, a steady low lasting eight seconds, and a sudden resurgence to normal. 
In terms of Mr. Monroe's experience, see his description of his technique on page 70, he reported that he rolled out of his body, found himself in the hallway, separating his room from the recording room for a few seconds, and then felt a need to get back into his body because of a difficulty in breathing. An assistant, I've, re I've read about that rolling technique too. Also the stepping from one surface to another with the breathing, yeah, okay. <clears throat> I got rolled out in his breathing. An assistant, Joan Crawford, <laughs> and I had been watching him on a closed circuit television set during this time, and we saw him move his arm slightly away from his throat just before he awoke and reported. <laughs> Mr. Monroe tried again to produce another out-of-body experience that would be evidential in terms of ESP. Crap, I forgot what that stands for. We already, we already just said it. Extrasensory perception. Yeah. Coming over and seeing the recording room and reading a target number on the shelf in that room, his brainwave pattern showed much light sleep. Much light sleep. So after three quarters of an hour, I called out to him over the intercom to remind him that we wanted him to try to produce an out of body experience. A while later, he reported having produced an out-of-body experience, but being unsure of his orientation. He followed a wire, which he thought led to the recording room, and instead found himself outside in a strange area that he never recalled seeing before. He decided he was hopelessly disoriented and came back to his body. His description of that area matched an interior courtyard of the building that he would indeed have found himself in during an out-of-body experience if he had inadvertently gone in exactly the opposite direction he should have. It is not absolutely certain that he had never seen this courtyard while visiting my office earlier in the day, so this experience is not in itself good evidence for a paranormal component to an out-of-body experience. <laughs> <clears throat> In terms of physiological changes, he again showed a stage one dreaming pattern with only two rapid eye movements in the whole period and no clear cut blood pressure drop on this occasion. Mr. Monroe's experiences, those of many prominent mystics throughout the ages and all the data of ESB indicate that our current physical view of the world is a very limited one, that the dimensions of reality are much wider than our current concepts. My attempts and those of other investigators to make these experiences behave in an acceptable fashion may not work out as well as we would like. Let me give two examples of experiments with Mr. Monroe, which were impressive to me personally, but which are very difficult to evaluate by our ordinary scientific criteria. Shortly after completing the first series of laboratory experiments, I moved from the East Coast to California. A few months after moving, my wife and I decided to set up an experiment. One evening, we would concentrate intensely for half an hour in an attempt to help Mr. Monroe have an out-of-body experience and come to our home. If he were then able to describe our home, this would produce good data on the parapsychological aspects of his out-of-body experiences. I telephoned Mr. Monroe that afternoon and told him only that we would try to direct him across the country to our home at some unspecified time that night without giving him any further details. That evening, I randomly selected a time which, I believed, would occur well after Mr. Monroe would be asleep. My random selection came out 11 p.m. California time or 2 a.m. East Coast time. At 11 p.m., my wife and I began our concentration. At 11.05 p.m., the telephone rang. Interrupting it, we did not answer the telephone, but tried to continue our concentration until 11.30. The following morning, I telephoned Mr. Monroe and told him only that the results had been encouraging and that he should write down an independent account of what he had experienced for later comparison against our independent accounts. On the evening of the experiment, Mr. Monroe had the following experience, which I quote from the notes he mailed me. 
Evening passed uneventfully, and I finally got into bed about 1.40 a.m., still wide awake, north side position. The cat was lying in bed with me. After a long period of calming my mind, a sense of warmth swept over my body with no break in consciousness, no pre-sleep. Almost immediately, I felt something or someone rocking my body from side to side, then tugging at my feet. I heard the cat let out a complaining yell. I recognized immediately that this had something to do with Charlie's experiment, and with full thrust, did not feel my usual caution about strangers. The tugging at the legs continued, and I finally managed to separate one second body arm and held it up, feeling around in the dark after a moment. After a moment, the tugging stopped, and a hand took my wrist, first gently, then very, very firmly, and pulled me out of the physical easily. Still, still trusting and a little excited, I expressed willingness to go to Charlie, if that was where he or it wanted to lead me. The answer came back affirmatively, although there was no sense of personality, very businesslike. With the hand around my wrist very firmly, I could feel a part of the arm belonging to the hand. Slightly hairy, muscular male. But I could not see who belonged to the arm. I also heard my name called once. This is blowing my mind. <laughs> then we started to move with the familiar feeling of something like air rushing around the body. After a short trip, seemed like five seconds in duration, we stopped and the hand released my wrist. I'm seeing like all of the aces of tarot. There was complete silence and darkness. Then I drifted down into what seemed to be a room. I've stopped quoting from Mr. Monroe's notes at this point, except to add that when he finished this brief trip, and got out of bed to telephone me, it was 2.05 a.m., his time. Thus the time match with my wife and I beginning to concentrate was extremely good. He felt the tug pulling him from his body within a minute or so of when we started to concentrate. Wow, our thoughts, y'alls. On the other hand, his continuing description of what our home looked like and what my wife and I were doing was not good at all. He perceived too many people in the room. He perceived me doing things I didn't do. And his description of the room itself was quite vague. What do I make of this? What do I make of this? This is one of those frustrating events that parapsychologists encounter when working with poorly controlled phenomena. It is not eventual, evidential enough to say that it was unquestionably a paranormal effect. Yet, it is difficult simply to say that nothing happened. It is comfortable to stick with our common sense assumptions that the physical world is what it seems to be, and that a man or his sense organs is either located at a certain place and able to observe it, or he is not. Some out-of-body experiences reported in the literature seem to fit this view, while others have a disturbing mixture of correct perceptions of the physical situation with perceptions of things that weren't there or didn't happen to us ordinary observers. Mr. Monroe reports a number of such mixed experiences in this book, especially his seeming to communicate with people while he is having an out-of-body experience, but they're never remembering it. The second puzzling experiment occurred in the fall of 1970 when I briefly visited Mr. Monroe in Virginia en route to a conference in Washington. Staying overnight, I requested that if he had an out-of-body ex body experience that night, he should come to my bedroom and try to pull me out of my body so I, could ex so I could have the experience too. I realized at the time that I made this request with a certain amount of ambivalence. I wanted him to succeed, yet another part of me did not. More on that later. Sometime after dawn that morning, I had slept somewhat fitfully and the light was occasionally waking me. I was dreaming when I began vaguely remembering that Mr. Monroe was supposed, was supposed to try to get me out of my body. I became partially conscious and felt a sense of vibration all around me in the dream world, a vibration that had a certain amount of indefinable menace connected with it. In spite of the fear this aroused, 
I thought that I should try to have an out-of-body experience, but at that point, I lost my thread of consciousness and only remember waking up a while later, feeling that the experiment was a failure. A week later, I received a letter from a colleague in New York, the well-known parapsychologist, Dr. Stanley Krippner, and I began to wonder if it really was a failure. He was writing to me about an experience his stepdaughter, Carrie, who I am quite fond of, had the same morning I was having my dream. Carrie had spontaneously reported to her father that she had seen me in a restaurant in New York City on her way to school that morning. She would have been roughly about, this would have been roughly about the time I was having the dream. Neither she nor her father knew that I was on the East Coast. What do you make of it? Or what do I make of this? <clears throat> This was the first time in years that I had consciously attempted to have an out-of-body experience. I have never, to my, acknowledge, to my knowledge, succeeded. And while I had no conscious memory of having one, a friend, a friend reports seeing me in a restaurant in New York City. Even more puzzling, I would have no desire in the world to go to a restaurant in New York City, a place I dislike intensely. If I were having an out-of-body experience, although visiting Carrie and her family is always very pleasant, Oh, wait, a place I dislike intensely if I were having an out-of-body experience, although visiting, okay, it's very pleasant. Coincidence? Again, something I would never present as scientific evidence of anything, but something I can't dismiss as meaningless. This last incident, incident illustrates an attitude towards out-of-body experiences that I have observed in myself, although I do not like to admit it, which is that I am somewhat afraid of them. Part of me is very interested in the phenomenon scientifically. Another part of me is excited at the prospect of personally experiencing it. A third part of me knows that an out-of-body experience is something like dying or opening up part of my mind to an unknown realm. And this third part is not at all anxious to get on with it. If out-of-body experiences are real, if the things Mr. Monroe describes cannot be dismissed as an interesting kind of fantasy or dream, our worldview is going to change radically and uncomfortably. <clears throat> One thing that psychologists are reasonably sure of about human nature is that it resists change. We like the world to be the way we think it is, even if we think it's unpleasant. At least we can anticipate what may happen. Change and uncertainty have possibilities of unsettling things happening, especially when that change doesn't take account of our desires, our wills, our egos. Heidi, yay! I have missed you. Welcome in! Awesome! Oh, Welcome. I have tried to talk mainly about straightforward scientific studies of out-of-body experiences in introducing this book, but now we get to what may be the most important aspect of the subject. Mr. Monroe's experiences are frightening. He is talking about dying, and dying is not a polite topic in our society. We leave it in the hands of priests and ministers to say comforting words. We occasionally joke about it, and we have a lot of aggressive fantasies about other people dying, but we don't really think about it. This book is going to make you think about death. You are not going to like some of the things it says and some of the thoughts it inspires. It will be very tempting to dismiss Robert Monroe as a madman. I would suggest that you not do that. Neither would I suggest that you take everything he says as absolute truth. He is a good reporter, a man I have immense respect for, but he is one man brought up in a particular culture at a particular time, and therefore his powers of observation are limited. If you bear this in mind, but pay serious attention to the experiences he describes, you may be disturbed, but you may learn some very important things in spite of being afraid. If you have had an out-of-body experience yourself, this book may help you to be less afraid or to develop your potentials for this experience into the valuable into a valuable talent. Read the book carefully and examine your reactions. If you really want to experience it yourself, good luck. Charles T. Tart, Davis, California, January 10th, 1971. Before I was born. Okie dokie. Wow, let's see how long chapter one is. Okay, that's cool, we'll get into it. I'm already at almost 50 minutes here. One. 
not with a wind nor lightly. The following ordinarily would appear in a foreword or preface. It is placed here on the assumption that most readers skip such preliminaries to get to the meat of the matter. I, uh, in this case, the following is the crux of it all. The primary pur purpose for the release and publication of the material contained here are one, that through dissemination as widely as possible, some other human being, perhaps just one, may be saved from the agony and terror of trial and error in an area where there have been no concrete answers, that he may have comfort in the knowledge that others have had the same experiences, that he will recognize in himself the phenomenon and thus avoid the trauma of psycho psychotherapy, or at worst, mental breakdown and commitment to a mental institution, and two, that tomorrow or in the years to come, the formal, accepted sciences of our culture will expand their horizons, concepts, postulates, and research to open wide the avenues and doorways in intimidated herein to the great enrichment of man's knowledge and understanding of himself and his complete environment." That's beautifully written. If one or both of these aims are served, whenever and wherever it may be, this is, su this is sufficient reward indeed. The presentation of such material is not designed for any particular scientific group. Rather, the principal attempt is to be as specific as possible in language understandable to scientists and laymen alike, with avoidance of ambiguous generalities. The physicist, chemist, life science, psychiatrist, and philosopher may each use more technical or specialized terminology to state the same premise. Such interpretation is expected. It will indicate that the plan of communication is workable, that the plain talk does convey the proper meaning to a wide base rather than to a narrow pinnacle of specialists. It is expected, too, that many interpretations will be contradictory. The most difficult mental process of all is to consider object objectively any concept which, if accepted as fact, will toss into discard will toss into discard a lifetime of training and experience. Yet much has already been accepted as fact on far less direct evidence than that presented here, and is now accepted. It is the hope that the same will apply to the data included here. It is indeed the most difficult mental process of all, this objective consideration business. Once in a lifetime is enough. Let's look for, for a beginning to this candid report of a highly personal experience. In the spring of 1958, I was living a reasonably normal life with a reasonably normal family. Because we appreciated nature and quiet, Ours was a country environment. The only unorthodox activity was my experimentation with techniques of data learning during sleep, with myself as the chief subject. The first sign of deviation from the norm took place on a Sunday afternoon. While the rest of the family had gone to church, I conducted an experiment by listening to a particular tape recording in a highly isolated environment. It was a simple attempt to force concentration on a single and intelligent signal source, oral, A-U-R-A-L, with lowered signal input from the other senses. Degree of retention and recall would indicate the success of the, of the technique. <clears throat> Isolated from other sights and sounds, I listened to the tape. It contained no unusual or stray suggestion. Most significant in retrospect, was the strong suggestion to remember and recall all that took place during the relaxation, relaxation exercise. The tape ran its course with no unusual resort, re result. My recall was thorough and complete because it had been a product of my own efforts and thus familiar to me. Perhaps too much so, as no retention and recall of original or new material was possible in my case. The technique would have to be utilized with some other subject. When my family returned, we all had brunch, which consisted of scrambled eggs, bacon, and coffee. Some unimportant controversy occurred at the table, which was not germane to the problem. A little over an hour later, I was seized with a service 
oh, I was seized with a severe iron hard cramp, which extended across my diaphragm or solar plexus area, just under my rib cage. It was a solid band of unyielding ache. Wow. At first, I thought it was some form of food poisoning from brunch. In desperation, I forced myself to regurgitate, but my stomach was empty. Other members of my family who had eaten the same food showed no signs of illness or discomfort. I tried exercising and walking on the assumption that it was a cramped abdominal muscle. It was not appendicitis as my appendix had been removed. I could breathe properly in spite of the pain and my heart appeared normal in pulse rate. There was no perspiration or other symptoms whatsoever, just the hard, tense, locked in place rigidity of a band of muscles in my upper abdomen. It occurred to me that perhaps some factor in the recording had caused it. In going over the tape and the written copy from which it had been made, I found nothing unusual. What suggestion was there? Oh, wait. What suggestion there was, I complied with, seeking to relieve any unconscious suggestion that might have been applied. Still, no relief. Perhaps I should have phoned immediately for a doctor. However, it didn't seem that serious, nor did it become any worse. But it didn't get any better either. Finally, we did phone for medical help. All of the local doctors were away or playing golf. From 1.30 in the afternoon until around midnight, the cramp and pain continued. No typical home medication seemed to alleviate it. Sometime after 12, I fell asleep from pure exhaustion. I woke up in the early morning and the cramp and pain were gone. There was muscle soreness throughout the, after, uh, throughout the afflicted area, much as one gets from over coughing, but no more. What caused the cramp in this area is still unknown. It is mentioned only because it was the first out of body, or it was the first out of the ordinary event, physical or otherwise, that took place. In retrospect, perhaps it was the touch of a magic wand or a sledgehammer, although I didn't know it at the time. Some three weeks later, the second major event entered the picture. There had been no further recorded tape experimentation because the suspicion was strong that the cramp was somehow related. Thus, there was nothing that apparently triggered the event. Again, it was a Sunday afternoon and the family had gone to church. I lay down on the couch in the living room for a short nap while the house was quiet. I had just become prone, head to the north, if that had any meaning. Then a beam or ray seemed to come out of the sky to the north at about a 30 degree angle from the horizon. It was like being struck by a warm light. Only this was daylight and no beam was, was visible, if there truly was one. I thought it was sunlight at first, although this was impossible on the north side of my house. The effect when the beam struck my entire body was to cause it to, sh was to, cause it to shake violently or vibrate. It was, I was utterly powerless to move. It was as if I were being held in a vice. Shocked and frightened, I forced myself to move. It was like pushing against invisible bonds. As I slowly sat upright on the couch, the shaking and vibration slowly faded away, and I was able to move freely. I stood up and walked around. There had been no loss of consciousness that I was aware of, and the cloak Oh, and the clock showed that only a few seconds had elapsed since I stretched out on the couch. I had not closed my eyes, and I had seen the room and heard outdoor noises during the entire episode. I looked out the window, especially to the north. Although why and what I expected to see, I don't know. Everything looked normal and serene. I went outside for a walk to puzzle over this strange thing that had happened. Within the following six weeks... The same peculiar condition manifested itself nine times. It occurred at different periods and locales. And the only common factor was that it began just, or I, just after I had lain down to, for rest or sleep. Whenever it took place, I fought myself to a sitting position and the shaking faded away. Although my body felt the shaking, I could see no visible evidence that it was doing so. My limited knowledge of medicine envisioned many possibilities as to the cause. I thought of ep epilepsy, but I understood that epileptics had no memory or sensation in such seizures, 
Furthermore, I understood that epilepsy is hereditary and shows signs at an early age, and neither was evident in my, in my case. Second was the possibility of a brain disorder, such as a tumor or growth. Again, the symptoms were not typical, but this could be it. With trepidation, I went to our longtime family physician, Dr. Richard Gordon, and explained the symptoms. As an internist and diagnost diagnostician, he should have had the what answers there may have been. He also knew my medical history, such as it was. After a thorough after a thorough physical, Dr. Gordon suggested that I had been working too hard, that I get more sleep and take off a little weight. In short, he could find nothing wrong with me physically. He laughed at the possibility of a brain tumor or epilepsy. I took his word for it and returned home relieved. If there was no physical basis for the phenomenon, I thought, it must be hallucinatory, a form of dreaming. Therefore, if the condition came again, I would observe it as objectively as possible. It, it obliged by coming on that very evening. It began some two minutes after I laid down to sleep. This time, I was determined to stay with it and see what happened rather than fight my way out of it. As I lay there, the feeling surged into my head and swept over my entire body. It was not shaking, but more of a vibration, steady and unvarying in frequency. It felt much like an electric shock running through the entire body without the pain involved. Also, the frequency seemed somewhat below the 60 cycle pulsation, perhaps half that rate. Frightened, I stayed with it, trying to remain calm. I could still see the room around me, but could hear little above the roaring sound caused by the vibrations. I wondered what would happen next. Nothing happened. After some five minutes, the sensation slowly faded away, and I got up feeling perfectly normal. My pulse rate was up, evidently due to the excitement, but no more. With this result, I lost much of my fear of the condition. In the next four or five occurrences of the vibration, I discovered little more. On one occasion, at least, it seemed to develop into a ring of sparks about two feet in diameter, with the axis of my body in the center of the ring. I could actually see this ring if I closed my eyes. The ring would start at the head and slowly sweep down to my toes and back to my head, keeping this up in a regular oscillation. The time of the cycle seemed to be some five seconds. As the ring passed over each section of my body, I could feel the vibrations like a band cutting through that section. When the ring passed over my head, a great roaring surged with it, and I felt the vibrations in my brain. I attempted to study this flaming electrical seeming ring, but could discover no reason for it or what it was. I fell into a burning ring of fire. I went down, 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 and the flames went higher, and it burns, burns, burns. Hmm. All of this remained unknown to my wife and children. I could see no reason to worry or concern them until something definite was known of it. I did take a friend into my confidence, a well-known psychologist, Dr. Foster Bradshaw. If it had not been for him, I cannot predict where I would be at this time, perhaps in an institution. I discussed the matter with him, and he was most interested. He suggested it might be some form of hallucination. Like Dr. Gordon, he knew me well. Consequently, he laughed at the concept that I was in the beginning stages of schizophrenia or the like. I asked him what he thought I should do. I shall always remember his answer. <clears throat> Why, there's nothing else you can do but look into it and see what it is. Dr. Bradshaw replied, anyhow, it doesn't seem you have much choice. If it happened to me, I'd go off in the woods somewhere and keep trying until I found the answer. <laughs> it is a memorable answer. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. All the chatting. It's so cool.
The difference was that it was happening to me and not to Dr. Bradshaw, and I couldn't afford to go off into the woods, either literally or figuratively. I had a family to support, among other things. Several months passed, several months passed, and the vibration condition continued to occur. It almost became boring until late one night when I was lying in bed just before sleep. The vibrations came, and I wearily and patiently waited for them to pass away so I could go to sleep. As I lay there, my arm was draped over the right side of the bed, fingers just brushing the rug. Idly, I tried to move my fingers and found I could scratch the rug without thinking or realizing that I could move my fingers during the vibration. I pushed with the tips of my fingers against the rug. After a moment's resistance, my fingers seemed to penetrate the rug and touch the floor underneath. With mild curiosity, I pushed my hand down further. My fingers went through the floor, and there was the rough upper surface of the ceiling of the room below. I felt around, and there was a small triangular chip of wood, a bent nail, and some sawdust. Only mildly interested in this daydream sensation, I pushed my hand still deeper. It went through the first floor ceiling, and I felt as if my whole arm was through the floor. My hand touched water. Without excitement, I splashed the water with my fingers. Suddenly, I became fully aware of the situation. I was wide awake. I could see the moonlit landscape through the window. I could feel myself lying on the bed, the covers over my body, the pillow under my head, my chest rising and falling as I breathed. The vibrations were still present, but to a lesser degree. One second, I got a cough. I hope I can get this out. One sec. Oh, yeah, I totally think I got it. Yet, impossibly, my hand was playing in a pool of water, and my arm felt as if it was struck down through the floor. I was surely wide awake, and the, sen the sensation was still there. How could I be aware in all other respects and still dream that my arm was stuck down through the floor? The vibration started to fade, and for some reason, I thought there was a connection between my arm stuck through the floor and their presence. If they faded away before I got my arm out, the floor might close in and I would lose my arm. Perhaps the vibrations had made a hole in the floor temporarily. I didn't stop to consider the how of it. I yanked my arm out of the floor, pulled it up on the bed, and the vibrations ended soon after. I got up, turned on the light, and looked at the spot beside the bed. There was no hole in the floor or rug. They were just as they always had been. I looked at my hand and arm. I even looked for the water on my hand. There was none, and my arm seemed perfectly normal. I looked about the room. My wife was sleeping quietly in the bed. Nothing seemed amiss. <laughs> I thought about the hallucination for a long time before I was able to calm down enough to sleep. The next day, I considered actually cutting a hole in the floor to see if what I had felt was there on the subfloor. The triangular chip of wood, the bent nail, and the sawdust. At the time, I couldn't see disfiguring the floor because of a wild, hallucina a hall wild hallucination. I told Dr. Bradshaw of this episode, and he agreed that it was a rather convincing daydream. He was in favor of cutting the hole in the floor to find out of what was there. He introduced me to Dr. Lewis Wolberg, a psychiatrist of note. At a dinner party, I casually mentioned the vibration phenomenon to Dr. Wolberg. He was only politely interested and evidently in no mood for business, for which I couldn't blame him. I didn't have the courage to ask him about the arm in the floor. It was becoming fairly confusing. My environment and personal experience had led me to expect some kind of answers or at least promising opinions from modern technology. I had an above normal scientific engineering and medical background as a layman. Now I was faced with something where answers or even extrapolation was not quickly available. In retrospect, I still cannot 
envisage. Envisage means envision, right? Envisage. Having dropped the matter entirely at the time. It may be that I could not have done so if I tried. Envisage. Envisage. If I thought I faced incongruities at this point, I, it was because I did not know what was yet to come. Some four weeks later, when the vibrations came again, I was duly curious or duly cautious about attempting to move an arm or leg. It was late at night and I was lying in bed before sleep. My wife had fallen asleep beside me. There was a surge that seemed to be in my head and quickly the condition spread through my body. It all seemed the same. As I lay there trying to decide how to analyze the thing in another way, I just happened to think how nice it would be to take a glider up and fly the next afternoon, my hobby at the time. Without considering any consequences, not knowing there would be any, I thought of the pleasure it would bring. After a moment, I became aware of something pressing against my shoulder. Half curious, I reached back and up to feel what it was. My hand encountered a smooth wall. I moved my hand along the wall the length of my arm, and it continued smooth and unbroken. My senses fully alert, I tried to see in the dim light. It was a wall, and I was lying against it with my shoulder. I immediately resonated. Uh, I immediately reasoned that I had gone to sleep and fallen out of bed. I had never done so before, but all sorts of strange things were happening, and falling out of bed was quite possible. Then I looked again. Something was wrong. This wall had no windows, no furniture against it, no doors. It was not a wall in my bedroom, yet somehow it was familiar. Identification came instantly. It wasn't a wall. It was the ceiling. I was floating against the ceiling, bouncing gently with any movement I made. I rolled in the air, startled, and looked down. There, in the dim light below me, was the bed. There were two fingers lying in the bed, two figures lying in the bed. To the right was my wife. Beside her was someone else. Both seemed asleep. This was a strange dream, I thought. I was, I was curious. Whom would I dream to be in bed with my wife? I looked more closely, and the shock was intense. I was the someone on the bed. My reaction was almost instantaneous. Here I was. There was my body. I was dying. This was death. And I was ready to die. And I wasn't ready to die. Somehow the vibrations were killing me. Desperately, like a diver, I swooped down to my body and dove in and then felt the bed and the covers. And when I opened my eyes, I was looking at the room from the perspective of my bed. What had happened? Had I truly almost died? My heart was beating rapidly but not unusually so. I moved my arms and legs. Everything seemed normal. The vibrations had faded away. I got up and walked around the room, looked out the window, smoked a cigarette. It was a long time before I had the courage to return to bed, lie down, and try to sleep. The following week, I returned to Dr. Gordon for another physical examination. I didn't tell him the reason for the visit, but he could see I was worried. He carefully examined me, ran blood tests, fluoroscopes, fluoroscopes, uh, electrocardiograms, palpitated all cavities, ran urinalysis, and about everything else he could think of. He checked very carefully for indications of brain lesions and asked me many questions relating to motor action in various parts of the body. He arranged for an EEG brainwave analysis, which evidently showed no unusual problem. At least he never reported any to me and I am sure he would have. Dr. Gordon gave me some tranquilizers and sent me home with orders to take off, to take off weight, smoke less, and get more rest, and said that if I had a problem, it was not a physical one. I met with Dr. Bradshaw, my psychologist friend. He was even less helpful and far from sympathetic when I told him the story. He thought I should try to repeat the experience if I could. I told him I wasn't ready to die. Oh, I don't think you'll do that, Dr. Bradshaw stated calmly. Some of the fellows who practice yoga and those Eastern religions claim they can do it whenever they want to. 
I asked him, do what? Why, get out of the physical body for a while, he replied. They, they claim they can go all over the place. You ought to try it. I told him that was ridiculous. Nobody can travel around without their physical body. Well, I wouldn't be too sure, Dr. Bradshaw replied calmly. You ought to read something about the Hindus. Did you study any philosophy in college? I said I had, but there was nothing I could recall about this traveling without the body business. Maybe you don't have the right... Maybe you didn't have the right philosophy, Professor. That's what it seems to me, Dr. Bradshaw. Dr. Bradshaw lit a cigar, then looked at me. Well, don't be so close-minded. Try it and find out, as my old philosophy professor said. If you're blind in one eye, turn your head. And if you're blind in both eyes, then open your ears and listen. I love that. <laughs> I asked what to do. I asked what to do if you were deaf, too. But I asked what to do if you were deaf, too. But I didn't get a reply. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Dr. Bradshaw had every reason to be casual about it. It was happening to me, not him. I don't know what I would have done without this pragmatic approach and his wonderful sense of humor. It is a debt I shall never be able to repay. The vibrations came and went six more times before I got up the courage to try to repeat the experience. When I did, it was an anti-climax. With the vibrations in full force, I thought of floating upward, and I did. I smoothly floated up over the bed, and when I willed myself to stop, I did, floating in midair. It was not a bad feeling at all, but I was nervous about falling suddenly. After a few seconds, I thought myself downward, and a moment later, I felt myself in bed again with all normal physical senses fully operating. There had been no discontinuity discontinuity in consciousness from the moment I lay down in bed until I got up after the vibrations faded. If it wasn't real, just a hallucination or dream, I was in trouble. I couldn't tell where wakefulness stopped and dreaming began. There are thousands of people in mental institutions who have just that problem. The second time I attempted to dissociate deliberately, I was successful. Again, I went up to ceiling height. However, this time I experienced an overwhelmingly strong sexual drive and could think of nothing else. Embarrassed and irritated at myself because of my inability to control this tide of emotion, I returned back to my physical body. It wasn't until some five episodes later that I discovered the secret of such control. The evident importance of sexuality in the whole subject is so great that it is covered in detail later. At the time, I was an exasperating, it was an exasperating mental block, which held me within the confines of the room where my physical body lay. With no other apl applicable terminology, I began to call the condition the second state, and the other, non-physical body we seem to possess, the second body. So far, this terminology fits as well as anything else. It wasn't until the first evidential experience, which could be checked that I seriously considered these to be anything but daydreams, hallucinations, and neurotic aberration. The beginnings of schizophrenia, fantasies caused by self-hypnosis self or worse. That very, oh, that first evidential experience was indeed a sledgehammer blow. If I accepted the data as fact, it struck hard at nearly all of my life experience to that date, my training, my concepts, and my sense of values. Most of all, it shattered my faith in the totality and certainty of our creatures, of our culture's scientific knowledge. I was sure our scientists had all the answers, or most of them. Conversely, if I rejected what was evident to me, if to no one else, then I would also be rejecting what I respected so greatly that mankind's emancipation and upward struggle depends chiefly upon his translation of the unknown into the known, through the use of his intellect and the scientific principle. That was the dilemma. It may have been truly the touch of a magic wand and a gift bestowed. I still don't know. 
That was chapter one. Chapter two, page 33. Man, it's so juicy. <laughs> Shoot. Hmm. I think I'm going to call it. Am I? It's so good. Crap, right? Yeah, I still have some other stuff that I got to get into today. Um, dang. I know I'll be back soon. Maybe tonight. We'll see what shakes. Maybe not. <laughs> I always say that. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So thank you everyone for coming and checking this out with me, man. We're going to start with chapter two next time I go live. Oh my goodness. Hey, where did my cool bookmark go? I think it's a quote by Thoreau on it. Son of a gun. I'm really good at losing bookmarks. I'll use this. All right, y'alls. Thank you so much, man. Awesome. Awesome. I appreciate you too. Oh my gosh. So yes, until next time, I will see you so soon. Thank you for hanging out with me until then.